Welcome back to the lab and welcome back to E. For everyone, now I think we've all been there before. At the start of any project, there seems to be a common decision. Should I do this the right way or should I do this the fast way? Should I string together 15 development boards or make my own custom design? In the world of electronics design, that is a very difficult question to answer. Simply put, it's not a binary choice. There are a lot of trade-offs, so let's talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Before we even get started, I need to give my answer some context. I know that it's lame, but you need to understand my point of view to apply this information correctly. I want to address two groups of I hope to directly address makers, people who are building something to solve a problem for themselves or to educate themselves. I also hope to directly address people that are trying to develop a product. For these people, that means that you need to obtain some regulatory certificates and you have to consider safety standards in a different way before you put an electronic product into the marketplace. With that said, every situation is different and you'll get in a lot of trouble if you just copy what you find on the internet. This is not design advice, this is not regulatory advice, this information is for educational purposes only, and you should never build a device, let alone launch a product into the world based on an educational example. The details matter, and you need to consider them. If you don't know how to consider these details, then I highly recommend that you spend some time consulting with both a safety agency and a local EMI compliance expert in your area. Even if what I said was correct for where I'm living in the United States, which it probably isn't, the rules are different in every country and they're different for every type of product. So you just can't take a general theory and apply it to everything. Right then, you're still here, so let's go. For this example, we're considering a DC motor controller. Logic and power come in and the motor spins as a result. I'll try to walk you through three different methodologies or stages of development that you might find yourself in if you try to build a system like this control system. It's often true that speed is everything and time is a major factor in whether to build something custom or buy a solution. Buying is probably the most applicable path for a maker. When you have a day job that works you for 40 to 60 hours a week, if you have a family at home, I mean, Time is tight for everyone, and like it or not, leveraging the work that other people have already done is probably the only way that your project will be done in a reasonable amount of time. I think that every highly motivated individual reaches this realization eventually, that even if you could do it better yourself, and even if you could save even 50% by building it yourself, it's probably not worth the long nights, the extra stress, and the time sacrificed in other areas of your life. I mean, every minute that you spend doing something is a minute that you aren't spending doing something else. When speed is everything, you're probably using some combination of products, development kits, and modules to stitch something together. While that's generally true, this approach isn't wholly set for makers, though. It has a place in traditional product development as well. The old phrase, time is money, still holds through, and if an employee can get together a somewhat functional system in five hours instead of a hundred, now that's a very good thing. Even if it's a rough prototype, a prototype will probably let some other people on the team learn something about this device before you invest all that time in designing something truly custom. Some amount of prototyping, analysis, and simulation will always be required, but why not start with prototyping? That will mean that the simulations you build and the analysis that you do in the future are probably going to be a bit more useful. But prototyping is not a replacement for those other design activities. It can be a huge compliment, though. With our first prototype, it cost about $5, took me about three hours, and I learned a couple key things. I learned that an Atmega 328P is capable of running a PID controller but not as quickly as I would prefer. The control time was too long. I also recognized a key limitation of this optical encoder. It can sense speed, not direction. That's something that I already knew, but I didn't consider all of the fallout. Like, I didn't consider all the implications of that, even though in my head I knew that with an encoder wheel you could only get speed. There's something about touching a physical system and seeing it with your eyes that really helps a person to understand. At any rate, this led to prototype two, 
which used an admittedly more expensive motor and a magnetic encoder that was integrated into that. This prototype also used an H-Bridge development board and the same microcontroller. This time, the controller is running a position modulation algorithm with two concurrent PI controllers, and that is a difficult task for a general-purpose 8-bit microcontroller like this one. We learned a bit more here. I realized that having a dedicated encoder peripheral is important, and that became a requirement for our microcontroller selection. I learned that choosing a microcontroller with a floating point computation unit and single cycle multiply would be very helpful. And this was all learned for about 50 bucks in about 10 hours. In the scale of product development, that money and that time is nothing. If I were a project manager, I'd tell my team to do this five times over if it meant that our first board would have a higher chance of working. Thankfully, I'm not a project manager. I'm an engineer. This leads us to the next stage of building something. Analysis. If you're a maker, run. I joke, but the only analysis a maker will probably do is determining if this can burn their house down, and if yes, how can I make sure this thing doesn't burn my house down? Seriously? Be careful. Some safety agencies I am most familiar with generally consider anything with a peak power above 15 watts a fire hazard, meaning it should be in a fire enclosure. I hate doing this, but I have to pick on them. 3D printers are a great example of what not to do here. There have been multiple house fires caused by 3D printers that didn't seriously consider the hazards. And if you're making a device, and that device burns down your own house, the insurance company probably isn't going to pay for it, and you're not going to have a house. So please, be careful. If you're designing a product... Analysis is so important because you absolutely need to consider whether or not your device is reliable and whether or not your device is safe. An unreliable device will never be successful. It'll be frustrating at best. And an unsafe device is just asking for problems. Your product could hurt someone else or damage their property. Selling a product that is taking responsibility for what that product does in the field, good or bad. This is where hand calculations, simulations, testing, this is where the bulk of time and effort in designing a product comes in. I wish I could say more, but it really just depends on what you're trying to build. It, it's, there's no universal rule here, but be careful, be smart. The third stage is the act of building the product, building your device. So yes, let's answer the question. When is it time to build something custom? Now for a maker... You might be building something custom if it either does not exist, like you can't buy it, or if you need to pull together so many different pieces that it'll take you longer to wire those pieces together than just build it from the ground up. I've certainly been there before. Total aside, but that's the motivation behind this whole motor series, because I want better motor control solutions to exist in the world so we can get past open loop stepper motors when someone needs motion. For a person building a product, I mean, it, it's time. It's time to build your product. You can't sell something that isn't built. And certainly selling a product filled with development kits will not be as profitable as selling a product with a custom circuit board inside. The simplest way I can explain this is a custom board or a custom design will only have the features you need. Any off-the-shelf module will have all the features anyone could need, and that's adding cost. For our motor project, this is where we are right now. I don't know if the design that we're about to make will be the final version, but what I do know is that this will be a step in the right direction. I think we're about to learn a whole lot about Modbus, motor control, encoders, and making a modular system. When this is all over, I'll let you know if this was a really good prototype or if another version becomes necessary. All right, before we wrap this up, I want to summarize the whole point of this video. I want to leave you with a couple questions to ask yourself before you decide whether to build something or buy something to solve your problem or achieve your goal. Do you have time to finish the project? I know it sounds simple, but projects always take longer than you think they will. Do you plan to sell this? Can you find an off-the-shelf solution? And if yes, does it meet your needs? And does the product or project have any risk of causing a fire? If yes, are you prepared to either pay for regulatory testing or accept the consequences if a fire occurs? Think big picture.
those are a couple questions that I think are probably a minimum for you to consider in the build versus buy conversation. And I'm sure that everyone watching this video has a wealth of personal experience. So please start a conversation in the comments if you have something to add. Also, uh, leave a like on this video if you thought this video was helpful to you as you're navigating this build versus buy. Coming up next, we'll be walking through a custom design, discussing supply chain, ordering quantities, and a couple details that we considered along the way. I'm really excited to share that with you. As always, I'd like to give a special thank you to our channel members on Patreon and YouTube. I really appreciate the extra step you've taken to support us directly. I also like to thank all of you for your support through viewership, comments, sharing what we do with others, those who choose to watch ads, and those who are subscribed. It has been awesome and humbling to watch this EE for Everyone community grow, and that can't happen without you. And I'm like, 4,000 people, man. Like, whoo, go us. So seriously, thank you. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching EE for Everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye. Side note, it feels so good to be back in the Motor Series. I may or may not have a pile of parts, and I am pumped. So, see you in the next one.